so you know what the program has developed um well, which was part of the program from way back in 2000 was what's known as assisted dispersal so to help the baboons um to help a male baboon move from where it is with its troop to another troop so that it can outbreed and can breed with unrelated females um if, if a male is dispersing he can be assisted by the program so he's physically caught um he's assessed for his health etc and then he's relocated so that's what happened to kataza he was relocated to tikai his life was to be ended um, I think in scientific terms it sounds better if you say um, euthanize but it was just the same as blatant killing and um, once we heard about what the authority was planning to do we decided to go up to Cape Town and uh, we negotiated with the authorities and everybody involved to save this Kataza's life and to bring him to Riverside. So for the first 10 days in, in, in quarantine, this poor animal only had loose feces and it's very similar to a diarrhea. Keep on yawning and, and crunching his teeth, which is all signs of very, very high levels of, of stress, um, chronic stress. We changed the diet because he, he, he once he was so highly stressed, he didn't respond like his natural instinct, and um, he did a lot of raiding um, restaurants and eating places and whatever it is. So he was living off very nice food. You know, with what Kataz illustrated very clearly was that um, when you've got a, a male baboon that has become habituated to food because it's high quality food and you know, if they can get access to food quickly, like we do, if we can get quick, easy food, we do it because then we can carry on having fun and chatting to our mates, etc. You know, it's become apparent that that there is no, if, if a baboon is that way inclined, there, there is really apparently no way of stopping him from raiding. And invariably what happens is young, young males get adventurous and they'll go off with a male like this. And then the next minute they're also raiding. He was breaking into houses. He was sitting on people's dining tables, eating food. And they all the potentials for disease transmission and the potentials for people to get injured, public health issues. He had become spoiled by um, human intervention. So um, as while a sanctuary is generally the conservation authorities don't support baboons going to sanctuaries because otherwise we'd have sanctuaries full of male baboons um, that have been dispersing. Uh, but, but as I say, I think for him, it was probably the, a fair outcome. We've got a piece of land, um, 600 hectares which we will, um, the young ones inside this enclosure and some of the, um, the older ones, we will formulate a troop now with him and all those, and we will release them inside that enclosure in that, um, in that, uh, on our farm, which is electrified fence uh, right around game fencing, and he can spend the rest of his life there. So he will not be hunted or, or be arrested with paintball guns and whatever it is. Once they're inside there, there is no, human um, monitors and interaction or whatever it is so they got to fend for themselves so uh, that that is very important for us so two years from now maybe three years and then Katas will be in his prime and uh, yeah then he can go i guess the biggest challenge with finding release sites is in south africa all the land is is divided up into uh, into portions you know so you've got somebody who's got 100 hectares, somebody's got 500 hectares, somebody's got 1,000. You're never just dealing with one land, landowner. So let's say you've got somebody who is open-minded and wants to have baboons on their property, um, wants to bring back baboons that were there once before uh, because they understand they're part of the, of the ecosystem and they play an important role. Um, generally for the permits, you need to get permission of neighboring landowners and it just takes one of those neighbors to, to say no and that's it, you're not going to get your permit. Yeah, there's the whole habitat shrinking people's mindsets on, on baboons and monkeys. Uh, it's generally 
find their good shit. And uh, yeah, they, especially with bins, they need a big, a big area. So we generally look at you know, 2,000, 2,500 hectares as the minimum. Um, have that buffer zone that they can move and not be on other people's property. Mm. So and just finding um, finding areas of South Africa where you're not going to look back where there's going to be conflict, you know, there's agriculture um, surrounding that, that piece of land or communities, you know, so it's, it's very difficult, you don't, you don't want to just throw them out there and have them run back into the same problems. One needs to educate the population on what are the risks to the animal and what are the things that attract it into the urban space and then how to manage that. And just to be responsible about living um, adjacent to wildlife. But baboons are challenging, you know, they're very challenging, they're very smart. Um, they learn very quickly how to, to access, you know, whatever. For example, you can baboon proof a bin with a certain type of lock and they might learn how to undo that lock. So you've got to continually be adapting and again, in terms of the program, we the, they talk about a toolbox of, of, of measures that you can use. So you might have the, the bear banger, you might have a painful marker, you've got your ranges, um, you can use sound, you can spray them with water, whatever. There are various measures that you can use. Electric fencing is fantastic, but you know it's only in limited areas. And, and you often find that you've got to chop and change these things um, to keep them on their toes, to keep the boons on their toes, because they will continually They'll, they'll learn when um, that uh, measure is not effective. The conflict has um, it escalated to such a point that, you know, people would take the law into their own hands and they would just shoot baboons. And, and invariably it's a male that gets shot because they're big, they're strong, they're perceived as dangerous, they've got these massive canines. And so, as I said, in, in it was 1998, um, a census was done. That's when it was realized that uh, the population was at risk of extinction. There were troops without males and the breeding potential was really being limited. And with the current program from 2012 on when um, aversive techniques were used, like the painful markers, the boons are now out of the urban area um 95 percent of the time so it's a huge improvement and the simple thing is if you keep baboons out of an urban space they are at less risk of having injury and 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 death resulting from it um and you know just currently because of a little bit of an impasse between the city of cape town and the sbca the rangers are not using painful markers so currently it has been agreed that the painful marker SOP standard operating procedure will be reviewed um, and there's always room for improving these guidelines and there's always room for uh, infield improvement of training of rangers but that's you know that's what um, programs are about.